I would like to begin by acknowledging, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, which is the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Aboriginal and Torres Strait people never ceded their sovereignty, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm Narita Waite, I'm a proud Yorta Yorta woman as, and Narangiri, and CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. Today, I'm joined by Mina Singh, a fellow Yorta Yorta woman, lawyer mm -hmm. advocate, former colleague at VALS, and newly appointed Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People. People. Welcome, Mina. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, on the lands of the Lachi Lachi people up in Mildura with close neighbours, the Barkindji people. And I also pay my respects to their elders past and present. Lovely. The 4th of August each year is National Aboriginal Strait Islander Children's Day. It was first marked in 1988 and was part of our people's protest against the ongoing impacts of colonisation during the bicentennial of invasion. National Aboriginal Islander Children's Day is an opportunity for our people to celebrate the strength of our children, families and communities. This, year, this year's theme is My Dreaming, My Future. So Mina and I will be discussing our work and how we're hoping to contribute to a better future for Aboriginal Islander children and young people. So Mina, what are the good things and the challenges that you remember from your childhood and what future did you envisage for yourself way back then? Oh, that's a big question. Definitely the good things were my big sisters. Um, I have two big sisters. They're quite a bit older than me. They're seven and eight years older than me. And they, I'm sure I was an, as annoying as heck for them as the little brat, the youngest, but they would just create these amazing play opportunities with me and indulge me and, teach me so many things and really guided me, you know, as a young person into adulthood. Um, just, yeah, I think they were the absolute highlights of, of growing up. But I was also one of those kids who absolutely loved school. So I, um, I think for me, uh, I just loved learning. And I think, you know, that's something my parents really focused on for us kids that you know neither of them had the opportunity to go through and finish uh, or, or go through a, a, a traditional you know education learning path so for them they were always focused on us uh, getting our education going on to uni and um, my mum in particular has just really modeled uh, lifelong learning and the joy of it so uh, yeah my big sissies and and learning um, I think were the, the big highlights for me growing up. Um, in terms of the not great things, you know, I mean, we were, we grew up in Croydon, out of Eastern Victoria, uh, out of Eastern Melbourne rather, and we were really the only visibly black, brown family, you know, around. And virtually all of my classes, I'm the only uh, black or brown face in in class photos and and such so uh experienced a fair share of racism um I think I probably had it easier because I just went to the one primary school and the one high school so people knew me I think if I had come and changed from a different school that would have had a bigger impact I was lucky because I had teachers that really encouraged me and really supported me. And you hear so many stories where that isn't the case. And I had, you know, teachers who really, really supported me. So, you know, the racism I experienced was more, was always from other kids, sometimes from adults, because um, kids got to learn somewhere, I guess. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's, yeah, it was hard. And it was always kind of a weight, I guess, that I knew I was potentially the only Aboriginal person or person of colour that a lot of these people were meeting. And so I felt a real burden with my behaviour and how I had to model good behaviour. And, you know, I was never naughty. I never did anything wrong. You know, I, I was kind of a model student. And I was very conscious that I never wanted anyone to be able to say, you know, this is, oh, well, you know, of course she's like that, she's black, you know, or of course she's, you know, doing this. So, it, you know, when I reflect on it, it's quite a weight to carry as a kid. And I think 
lots of our kids feel that feel that difference you know we we you would see other kids get away with stuff and you think I couldn't get away with that or if I tried that I'd be treated very differently I think I think when I was a teenager especially I thought in the future we're going to get to this place where there's no racism where everyone's kind of you know everyone's seen as equal and you know the world's going to improve you know when you're younger you always think of things improving and stuff and um, I was actually having this conversation with someone just yesterday that sometimes I just absolutely despair about how attitudes about racism have both in some ways gone forwards but in some ways have gone completely backwards and um, you know that it feels like we're explaining such simple things and I think part of the challenge is people try to think their way through experiences of racism when really it's a thing that you need to empathetically feel and think about the impact I think that was my big hope I don't you know I kind of I guess in terms of what did I want to be when I grow up um I, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer at a fairly at some point in high school I may, I, I thought that um but you know yeah I don't yeah <laughs> No, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I was always the only black kid um, in mm. school. I went to four different primary schools because of different yeah. ages. And, yeah. you know, you're the only black kid. Um, yeah. You're punished for being outspoken, particularly challenging yeah. certain, um, certain yeah. records about history and things that have been mm. And then you mm. just learn that school isn't a safe place to sort of express your opinions. Um, yeah. That you take it there to learn. Um, yeah I mean it, it didn't stick with me in high school that's for sure I'll probably become yeah. more outspoken and problematic then uh, <laughs> that's my family's way unfortunately um, <laughs> I understand that in terms of racism too I agree with you like it's really fearful being a mom of two little boys who at the moment are in this safe little bubble a bubble up yeah. world where you know they've got Aboriginal teachers you know they've got their little friends and you know they're safe and contained and protected and just able mm. to embrace learning but it yeah. is likely that they're going to enter a school where they are the only black kid yeah um, and that's going to yeah. be complete I mean for Mateo it's coming up very quickly um, yeah you know that's going to be real a real challenge for him because he is yeah. so strong and in his identity and what he yeah. and feels yeah. so yeah I agree with you that things have gone backwards but I think there is an inability particularly as we utilize avenues like treaty in your rook mm -hmm. um, to really kind of advance that conversation on addressing racism yeah so, yeah but you know that I that, sorry just Mateo's you know strong identity and strength that's what's gonna keep him strong going forward and and that's what's gonna you know you know that that connection to identity is so important and you and I see what happens when kids don't have the benefit of that and you know so many things get in the way of that and you know the fact that he's got this great grounding and that's what's going to keep him safe going forward you know that's what's gonna you know Definitely look after to him. extend that early childhood network of Aboriginal yeah kindergartens because it really is that real safe grounding moment I mean back in my mum's day she before she went to school which was really tough you know she mm. had that safe protected bubble in the form of community because they all yeah. raised and looked after and played together back home in Shep. Yeah. um yeah. But, you know um it'd be great if we could kind of adapt that across Australia um just to really yeah. kids and give them that grounding. yeah, yeah. And, but it's, it's Oh, sorry. <laughs> we, we probably won't even get through the questions because we'll just yarn on about all the stuff. But, um, like, yeah, like my mum grew up with lots of different relatives, you know, mm. basically so she wouldn't be stolen. And, and you know, she by the time she was 12, 13, she'd been to 20-odd schools. And, um, you know, she was always kind of starting again and, you know, but... The thing she always had was she always was with family. She always was with culture, and that's what's kept her really. To, to me, looking at her, that's what's kept her strong. She always knew who she was in, you know. And and we see it in, in in 
in the work that we do, you know, when kids are, you know, have to be moved, you know, for safety reasons from their families and stuff, you know, keeping them with other family members and keeping them connected to culture is just so important. It's just, you know, and it's, you can't sort of see what, you know, once something's not there, that's when you feel its absence. But when something is around you and, and you know, um, cocooning you, that safe bubble, like you said, you know, you feel that. And then once it's gone, it's like, oh, you know, how do you bring it back? Yeah. Yeah. And it's sad for those kids. I mean, our evaluation of Balitnalu found mm. that it necessarily wasn't the legal work. Um, mm. that led to, you know, these children um, feeling safe and secure. It was the work of the YSO, so the youth support officers, yeah. in connecting yeah. with the culture and community that led yeah. to the great outcomes. Um, yeah. I think sometimes we lose focus when we're talking about children um, going through youth justice or um, going through both systems, so child protection youth justice, around the mm. need to continuously connect to culture and community. And that can be different for each kid. And we need to have those flexible yep. approaches which I don't yeah. think is good at delivering yet. Yeah, yeah. And it's because, you know, you think about the legal problems that anyone has. They come out generally from personal circumstances and particularly for our community with our history and the way colonisation has caused so much damage. You know, our the legal problems stem out of those personal circumstances. And so, yes, you can address the legal issue, but unless those other things are being addressed as well, and that's what Bells has always been, you know, ALS is, that's what has always been so that understanding of the legal problem in the bigger context of this person's life. And um, yeah, it's just so great. The work of Alec Nilu and just Bells, it's just, yeah. <laughs> it's fortunate to be part of the organization and it's yeah. like, so you talked about how um, you wanted to be a lawyer, but and you obviously su succeeded in that and did extremely well. Um, and then I don't know if I could go back. I don't know if I'd be a lawyer again. <laughs> I don't know. I think you get to a point that you either you're either meant to be a lifelong lawyer or you're just meant to experience it for a period of time and then it needs to be yeah. over. That's I think right. That's right. Into the camps. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you in the latter. I, I honestly, <laughs> even though I committed to this career path at six, um, I actually honestly don't think, looking back, I would say, you know, that's what I was meant to do. I feel that I'm, I'm definitely more at home um, in trying to create change. Yeah. Part yeah. of the formal legal court system. Yeah. So, Obviously, you've done some excellent things and um, we're proud to have you part of our legacy, but what are the things that you're hoping to achieve in your new role um, to really give kids a fair shake of things, really? So, yes, I think yesterday marked three months in the role, so um, I'm kind of a bit impatient with myself and, you know, all the stuff I need to know and need to do and um you know I'm definitely a sprinter <laughs> and this is um uh this is marathon work this is this is you know the long the long vision and you know there's so many kind of little things you need to do to bring change in the big picture and you know what despairs me is what causes despair is is just the rates of our kids in out of home care and you know, whilst we see some, you know, whilst we see some amazing outcomes with Aboriginal kids being reunited with families through the work of ACOs, you know, my big focus, my big passion is about early intervention. And, um, you know, I think as a, as a lawyer, what you see is you come in at the end when everything's gone to crap and you can see all the different kind of holes along the way in the net where people have just continued to slip and, and fall through through the net. And, you know, the work that we do in early intervention is so important to set up children's lives. But even before that, you know, how do we work with community before they're even having, you know, how do we support our community to just be the best that they possibly can be? And, you know, bringing our children into these you know, strong communities and, one thing I'm really 
interested in is how do we embed cultural practices of parenting in the way that we, uh, if we have to remove a child, how do we, or when we need to support a family, how do we embed cultural practices? And, you know, I think, you know, for, for our communities, for other Indigenous communities around, for other Black and Brown communities, it's that communal parenting. It's the parenting that's done with, you know, not just mum and dad, it's done with mum and sisters, it's done with mum, dad and brothers, uncles, aunties, pops, nans, cousins. Everyone's involved and that's strength and that's safety. Yet what I think, what I know has happened is that there's been introduced a, a Western lens that reduces family down to two parents and, and the kids and expects that they should be able to do everything. And we know with the history of our communities and, and how colonisation has worked that the very things that have kept us strong for thousands of years have been deliberately eroded away. And so how do we bring those practices back? And, you know, I'd love to see um, different approaches to to parenting and raising kids in that in that joint collaborative way. You know, let's get, you know, houses that have space for more than one family so that pe families can live together and support each other and, and you know, kids can grow up with other, other you know, with siblings and, and cousins and stuff in the state, you know, where we recognise, you know, this stuff can be difficult. Like it's, you know, even without experiences of trauma and such, you know, it, it's it's tough being a parent you know I mean I only have dogs but I you know <laughs> I can see you know I've had a big hand in raising my nieces and nephews but you know you know we need to acknowledge where our strength is in community and how to highlight that more and more and so I'd love to see more of that sort of work that's really exciting yeah. to me just because like I can I, I just think it's so it's such a missing piece of work and something yeah. that has such a big impact. And yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, every um, Aboriginal person who's grown up safe in their families um, and connected to them really understands as being beneficial. I mean, my mum was a single mum by, by circumstance. Mm. My dad passed early. And yeah. without having her sister, um, yeah. who was also a single mum, um, and yeah. having her brothers and, you know, them being able to reside with one another when it needed to provide additional support, like... I think I would be a completely different human without that. So it's really yeah. exciting that that's something you're yeah. doing. So I'm Mildura, in Mildura doing um, consultations with children and young people in different services and we're uh, doing an inquiry into uh, educational experiences of children in out-of-home care. And one of the uh, workers that we met with talked about this web of safety around the child and how who are all the people that support the child and go around them and you know when are we, you know we know there's strength in in community and that extended not extended I'm going to stop using extended because that's family a bigger family around you know a child but um there's still approaches to to parenting that are very uh, individualistic that are very um focused on you know very particular models of parenting and I think there's just so much more we need to learn from um and, and not just learn but actively invest in and actively put you know time and an effort into I'd love there to be some honest and frank discussions around racism and experiences of children and young people and racism and um you know, in that sense that we've come along, you know, yes, we have come a long way and, you know, there's more understanding of ideas around systemic and institutional racism, but I'd like to really start to talk about ownership of it and who invests in it, who benefits from it, who, not just who, who, who experiences pain from it. If we look at stolen generation and, and the notions that was based on of, of, of basically, you know, destroying identity ties and cultural ties and stuff. And then, you know, how those how those ideas permeate through into, you know, 
modern child protection systems. And, you know, someone talked, someone spoke the other day about um, recognising the difference between poverty and neglect and, you know, how much your own experiences and what you experienced growing up and what you saw in your own family and other families will shape the lens for what you see in other families. So um, it's it's really important we challenge those basic ideas that underpin the decisions that are being made about our community. Um, they're two big things. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, the Our Youth Our Way um, report last year, um, you know, amazing work, you know, included the recommendation to raise the age, you know, this huge work that's being done by community and, and so many other organisations. And I look at the, you know, when I was at the Human Rights Law Centre and involved in the advocacy in that space and such, you know, there's just so many pieces of, of evidence and so many different uh, parts of the community who can see this so strongly. You know, when you think about the way our kids and, and ki you know, kids in general can go from child protection into um, into youth justice spaces and you think of the trauma that comes with experiences of being removed from your family and then put into what usually is often multiple placements and, mm. um, you know, and then you wonder how a child doesn't make good choices and make good decisions when on top of the fact that they're still developing, even if they had the perfect upbringing, they still are developing, but they've got trauma on top of that and they're yet still supposed to be held to adult accountabilities at the age of 10. And it's kind of diabolical to me. <laughs> it is because as they're moving through those placements, Mina, they're, they're really just raising themselves um, because there's no consistent care. There's no... Um, consistent guidance and with the changes that were made back in 214 to the Children's Youth and Families Act, you know, mm. there is little um, discretion for the courts to ensure that families can have consistent connection um, to mm. their kids and have that ability to play a guiding hand. So I, I yeah, 100% agree with you. And you mentioned our youth our way. And I'm just wondering, other than obviously not progressing race the age um, for no good reason, um, what other recommend uh, you know has there been progress on any other recommendations from government on that report look there has been I mean um you know there's the amazing the the Aboriginal youth strategy uh youth justice strategy that has been developed that was launched earlier that year that that picks up some great things from our youth our way and if you just look at the language of it the way it is worded as a child and young person centered voice is, you know, and and you know, obviously there's amazing work done with um, with the Koori Youth Council and ensuring that voice came through. Um, you know, there's definitely um, in some areas you can see a shift in thinking um, around what do Aboriginal kids need and what are the experiences they're bringing with them into this space and ensuring that culture is centered in in response in in the responses to to their needs and such but it's 30 years since royal commission into aboriginal deaths in custody the things that were said in that still haven't been done still haven't been implemented um in a, in a properly resourced um a way that that has that creates positive outcomes and i worry i i I'm really focused on outcomes. I'm really, you know, what's going to be um, the outcome of, of implementing our recommendations and how are we going to measure it and how are we going to, are we going to give it, give these recommendations and their implementation time to, to take hold and to learn from them? I worry about that. Yeah. It's, it's all very well for, you know, to say we've done this and this and this, um, but as a, you know, as a evaluation guru told me years ago, you know, you've always got to ask, but so what, you know, what does it, what's the change that's come out of it? So, um, yeah, there's, I think definitely there's a shift in how we approach, how we approach the, the issues, but I really worry about the broader 
you know, we work in the sector, we work in the space, we understand the nuanced issues that are involved. But I really worry when I look at broader dialogue in the community um, around how dehumanised um, children are when it comes to, to offending and again, this idea that these children and young people are supposed to have the same agency and decision-making abilities as adults when, for so, you know, sadly, for so many of them, adults have let them down. So where are they meant to automatically learn these things? You know, like you said, you know, kids end up raising themselves and, yeah, I've gone off on a tangent then. I like tangents. <laughs> a tangent I, I think it's it's definitely relevant because um i just don't think that there is a proactive engagement with community on having these conversations and putting them mm. into the everyday vernacular and you see that with the way the media reports you see that with the way that politicians present conversations and dialogues whether it be in parliament um, or whether it be um, on their socials um, and mm or at their constituent office. Um, a lot of the time um, they use language, like you said, that's dehumanizing um, and mm. try to take it away. Because I think that if you if you engage with community and humanize these children, they will see these children as their own children. Um, and yeah. you know, they'll want better outcomes for them. That's why you see so many people saying that they would be happy for the um, age of criminality to be raised because they see the benefit in it. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a thing in our society. I think we've just broken down that communication between politicians and governments and everyday community. And I, I really do hope that, um, like you do, that there is that change in the future. Yeah. And it's with Raise the Age, it's so, uh, you know, so many people mm. don't know the age of criminal responsibility. And, and I was blown away by how many parents don't know and it's interesting to think that you know you of, of course I'm sure most parents you know all parents assume that my kid's not going to do the wrong thing but that's not the point <laughs> you know the, the the you know you can put everything in in place for your child and everything but they still might make choices that you know aren't good you know or, or or get them into trouble and I think it, it was it's just been interesting seeing raise the age uh garner attention of so many parts of the community and I think you know it's making people care about issues that won't necessarily impact on them you know and it's um making people think about everyone in the community not just people who are just like them, you know. Um, I think that's one of the biggest battles we face. Yeah, 100%. And um, as you know, that this year is the 25th anniversary of the Bringing Them um, Home report, and we did have the National Apology um, by Kevin Rudd in 2007 to the Stolen Generations, and um, Victoria just started rolling out um, the reparation packages for the Stolen Gens with some minor hiccups, one could say. Um, but Victoria has the highest rate of Aboriginal children out of home care and the highest mm -hmm. rate of Aboriginal children on care and protection orders. So it seems that government acknowledge the harms um, that taking our children away creates, but that doesn't actually translate into any political will uh, because many of the systems that are currently in place will create are creating another stolen generation. So what's stopping reform and how do we overcome those blocks? Just an easy question, Mina, for you. Just an easy one. Another, another easy one. Um, I think when it comes to child protection spaces, what I what I hear a lot of is that we've got uh, a system that has been neglected for a really long time in terms of uh, what resources it needs, and then what resources are put in are just a, a, a plain catch up. You know, and um, you know, in the the systemic inquiries that that the commission does, um, particularly into child protection, you know, we see issues of of you know case overload of children not getting you know uh, 
the appropriate attention and you know all of this has a direct impact on the child's experiences so I think you know there's been a lot of call of you know there's been a lot of spotlight on on um on child protection systems not just in Victoria but in Australia over the last couple of months and you know a lot of people are, are calling for a royal commission and um you know I think uh you know like uh Leanna Buchanan the principal commissioner you know said royal the thing is we know so much of what needs to be done um a royal commission can help us you know if if recommendations are implemented with proper funding with proper evaluation to see how they go that's the benefit I think but there's so much that is known about what needs to be done and what where the supports are we know we need early intervention supports and what that requires is work outside of the child protection space um, we need you know community knows that you know aboriginal ways of working is holistic we know that if you do something over there you're going to have an impact down the road over here so what we do in the space of housing if we don't have a safe house for for example um a, you know a woman fleeing family violence for her and her kids to go to I mean no family violence is the biggest driver of all children going into out of home care you know if we don't have something safe if we don't have the basics taken care of then you've got no platform for any of the other work that needs to be done to take you know it's it, you know I often think of I don't know we should just have Maslow's hierarchy of need everywhere that you know the bottom of the triangle is a safe home you know that's the foundation that everything is built on from a safe home you can rest you can go to work you can go to school you can um be safe you can you know and then you can you know work to do those other things but if you're you know if we've got parents who've had their children removed and they're dealing with so many different traumas and they need to address those the, the behaviors that are coming out of that trauma if we're not even thinking about where they're going to live and that that's going to be a stable ongoing place the chances of, of children coming back to them are remote because they don't have that solid ground to work on and so you know the this, you know, our systems need to work much more collaboratively with each other. We need to have a really clear picture of what our overarching goal is, you know. And if we talk, if it's about the safety of, of safety and well-being of, of children and young people, then we need to place them at the centre and build that that web of safety around them. And that's not just something that child protection can do. There needs to be other supports, but equally when the supports don't work, child protection needs to be properly funded so that the first time they engage with a family, it has positive impact. Sometimes, you know, so part of the commission's work, a really sad, horrible part is uh, the, the conducting of child death inquiries. And if a child dies who has in the last 12 months of their life had engagement with child protection in some way, we conduct an inquiry and we can't look at the cause of death. That's not our remit. That's for other powers to determine, coroner and police. Um, but we look at what's the services that have been provided and could they have been improved? And, you know, we often see children who have had multiple reports um, to child protection, um, but nothing coming of them. And you know, we need to we need to see that that first point of engagement is positive because it sets the tone for for continuing engagement. You know, that's just that's just common sense. You know, that first point of interaction with someone has to be the point has to be a point of building trust, and it has to be something positive that someone's going to gain something out of this <sighs> there's so much <laughs> so there is and you know uh, taking services to where the client is 
um, yes, yes. Client continually having to track is, is incredibly important because often enough with our clients who are adults, what we see them is desperately trying to engage with child protection, desperately trying to engage with services they're referred to. But like you said, because they're so under-resourced, there's yeah. just no liability and then time runs out and then there's yeah. no way to yes. connect, yes. reunify with children. So it, I 100% agree with you. Those first interactions are crucial because that really will set the pathway for success. And I think yeah. it harks back to what you were talking about, about tracking outcomes. Um, that, mm. you know, we were focused also on looking at the outcomes of our investment, looking at the outcomes of our approaches, perhaps mm. we have a greater impact. Um, yeah. And with all of the trauma that you're exposed to in your current role, but even if I look at the work that you did at HRLC and, of course, here, yeah. Mm. You know, what gives you the strength to keep working and <laughs> pushing for change? Please tell us your secret. <laughs> um, well, I said I have two dogs. So <laughs> they are, you know, you've got to have your, um, your, you've got to find your joy. You've got to find the things that, you know, spark joy. <laughs> you know, the things that give you pure you know, joy and, you know, my dogs, they are small and erratic and, yeah, <laughs> um, but they give me so much love, you know, all, all of our dogs over the years, you know, and so for me that's a really big uh, mental health um, support. But also I've gotten better at asking for help as I've gotten older and I think there's a lot of us who probably think that asking for help is is a bit weak, is a bit, you know, oh, I should be able to do this, I should be able to work this out by myself. But, you know, we can't. There's times that we can't figure out all the things and do all the things by ourselves. And I think getting better at asking for help uh, is, is something that's definitely helped me. And so whether that's been... Um, help from colleagues, whether that's been professional help, like from, from a counsellor or a therapist, something like that, um, an elder, um, you know. But also the flip side of that, something that makes me feel good and positive is doing the help, is helping others. And, um, you know, if I kind of look at what my career has been and you know, working in law, but also working in vocational education and consulting and such. And I think what sort of shaped it is the idea that I've been able to help people, help other people empower themselves and, and take the next steps that they need to. And, um, you know, I think that's why I prefer to think of that the work that we do is advocacy rather than lawyering, because it's such a broader, a broader space. And, I think, you know, the, the trip I'm doing right now, meeting with community and, and getting out and about, you know, hearing from children and young people and you, you talk to some of them and you're like, oh, my gosh, you're just going to be the next big thing. Like, you, you know, you are amazing. But, you know, equally I hope uh, they get it. I just, you know, hope they get a chance to be kids as well, you know, just not worry too much about adult things but just get a chance to experience being a kid and, and the, you know without weight of responsibility and um yeah so yeah also you know chocolate and um <laughs> um pizza and you know, food in general and um but I, I think I think what keeps me going is knowing there are others who feel the same way who and um who want to do this work and working collaboratively with them. And, um, and then I look at our elders who have been working in this space, have been fighting for so long, and I look at their, their community knowledge and I look at their historical knowledge about how they know so much that's happened in our communities and I look at them and I think, and they had far less than us, you know, um, and I think that's what really, really drives me. I think that's what, you know, um, gets it real. Yeah, makes it real and important. 
Oh, thank you so much for your time, Mina. It's always so lovely to speak with you and get your insights. And then it's not always, it's, it's always insightful, but um, there's always that touch of humour and kindness that you bring to everything you <laughs> do. So thank you so much. We My pleasure. Love working with you um, and the commission itself and hope to continue um, that in the coming years. And we wish you um, and the commission and the Office for the Commission of Children and Young People um, a great National Aboriginal Islander Children's Day. And to you too, especially to Barlet Nalu and your fantastic clients and community. Oh, thanks so much, Mina. <laughs> Thank you.